question. Thank you. Yeah, so over the last year, uh, I've been working with a bunch of colleagues on a project called NTPD RS, uh, which we think brings NTP into the modern era. So, question number one, what is NTP? Um, so NTP stands for the Network Time Protocol, and it is a protocol that synchronizes time across the network, down to a precision of about a millisecond. And this may seem like quite a bit of precision. Certainly, no one will fault you for being late to a meeting by a millisecond. And so for individual people, like that sort of precision doesn't really matter. Um, but it turns out that for any sort of computer network, it is very important that all of the machines on that network are synchronized. Um, now, the clocks in our devices are sort of OK. They have to be cheap and compact um, and light. Um, so they aren't perfectly precise, and they will drift over time. And also, how much they drift per sort of hour uh, fluctuates based on, say, temperature. And so to keep this thing perfectly synchronized, as synchronized as it needs to be, it needs to be sort of continually updated. Um, and that's what we do using NTP. Uh, and there's a sort of two main use cases, if you will. Um, the first one is consistency within the network. So imagine you have two machines, and they communicate on some task, and at some point, we hit a panic. Now, what we want to do is figure out what happened here. What is the timeline that led up to this, this panic event? And so what we would like to do is turn to the logs of these two machines, look at um, the timestamps of all of the log messages, and sort of interleave these two logs into one timeline. Right? We just sort based on the timestamp of every log message. Um, but that only works when the two clocks are synchronized. They need to be synchronized pretty exactly, otherwise uh, events start happening out of order in this, this new timeline that we create. And a message might be received before it's even sent. And that would be a terrible debugging journey. Um, the second um, sort of use case of NTP is in security. Um, so here's an anecdote about um, at Tweede Hof, we run our own GitLab server. And it turns out that at some point, the NTP daemon, so that is the program that does the synchronization, had crashed. And because NTP is very um, obscure, and not a lot of people know about it, unless either it goes wrong or you are in this room, um, we just hadn't noticed. And so this clock on this machine had drifted quite a bit, so several minutes at some point. And then one day, we went to log in with our two-factor authentication code, and the server rejected it immediately, um, because it thought that the code had already expired, uh, which is really annoying. You have to SSH into the machine, and you have to reboot a bunch of stuff. Uh, but then it works again. So that is really annoying. The inverse of this is way, way worse, where we can trick a machine into believing something is still valid, uh, even though it has actually expired. And, and this is a big problem for, say, TLS, so sort of the, the underlying mechanism of HTTPS, uh, which uses these certificates that are revoked at a certain point. And um, if you can trick a machine into believing that a, an expired certificate is still valid, you break sort of the whole security model of, of TLS. Um, so security is a big and important part of this project, uh, sort of the, the structural uh, security of, of this whole program. So then, how does NTP work? Well, first of all, to synchronize, we need to synchronize to something. So we need some sort of source of true time. Um, and this is provided by atomic clocks at various sort of locations around the world, um, and by GPS satellites. Um, and these are a little bit less precise, but still more than enough for, for what we need to do. So at our office, we actually have a little antenna, which we have to put outside, because the office is a Faraday cage. And then um, we can get this very accurate time signal. Um, then we hook that up to a computer, basically. And this computer can um, serve as a, an NTP server. And this is called Stratum 1, because it's sort of directed uh, um, or connected directly to the source. Then um, NTP clients can sort of come by the server and ask, hey, what time is it for you right now? And they can sort of distribute this again. So a client can be a server uh, to, to other clients. And this sort of recurses all the way down to consumer uh, devices. So that's how that's uh, distributed. Then for an individual client, it's very important that you listen to multiple sources. Because if you li listen to one, uh, you're very vulnerable to either like someone tripping over a power cord and just sort of drift off, um, or uh, an attacker compromising this one server, and they can then steer your time to either annoy you or um, actually start attacking other things on your system. So NTP itself isn't that 
you know, there's no secrets that you leak, but NTP is in a sort of an entry point for other attacks. And so it's still crucial that we, uh, we get our stuff right. So why, though, did we decide to implement this in Rust? Why did we re-implement this at all? There are existing implementations. We could just leave that be and, and not worry about this. Why is it that we implement this now? And I think there's sort of there's two categories of reasons for this, um, the social and the technical reasons. So in terms of social reasons, there are existing implementations. There's like three, which isn't that much, actually. Um, and uh, more importantly, they are maintained by like one person or like a handful of people. Uh, it's a very small group. And if those people ever decide to do something different with their lives, then we have a big problem. Uh, furthermore, attracting new people to those projects is tricky. Um, because these are code bases that are decades old, they are C code bases, um, which means that they also sort of handle their own half of a standard library and a threading abstraction. Um, and then NTP in and of itself is not an easy thing to understand. So these code bases are really pretty tricky, to the point that we didn't actually use them all that much. Um, it was <laughs> actually way easier to just start from nothing and read the spec and go from there. Um, and then we, we looked at them for some, some tiny details from time to time. Um, and so a modern languages typically have a much better story around this. Oh yeah, I forgot, like these projects, of course, also have their own custom build system because you've got to do that in C. Um, and so Rust um, provides a much sort of more and more solid foundation for having very consistent tooling and a much better sort of onboarding experience to your project, which is what we're already seeing with our, our GitHub repository. Um, and then there's also a bunch of technical reasons why a modern language, and in particular Rust, is a really good fit. So Rust is a, a very low-level language. Um, it's efficient. It's very good at utilizing multiple cores and, and doing concurrent work. Um, also, Rust is memory safe, but that isn't so important here, I feel like, because we aren't really doing all that much with memory. It's mostly I.O. stuff. Uh, really, what we want is no sec faults, which is something that C projects can never guarantee, and we can, just trivially. Um, we get very nice tooling, so we get tests and benchmarks, and in particular, fuzzing is very important here. Uh, we open up UDP ports to the network, um, so people can just sort of send whatever, uh, and we want to make sure that we just handle um, whatever they send our way and, and don't panic um, or cause other weird behavior. Uh, and then also, of course, we can use the package ecosystem. Um, so we use like Clap and LibC and, um, and Tokyo. And also, actually, we use Russell's in an extension called NTS, um, which adds additional security to this time signal, um, which means that our code base is just NTP. It doesn't try to implement half of a standard library. It doesn't implement all of this other stuff. It's just the NTP, uh, the protocol, and sort of the I.O. Um, in the end, our project is, is sort of of similar size to the C projects, and that's because we actually have a lot of tests, and also because Rust is sort of line-heavy in its formatting. So when you use a lot of open source software, it's also only reasonable that you contribute back. And this has actually been a very sort of fun experience. Um, certainly for libc, we added a bunch of new sort of like timing-related structs. And there you have a couple people that are super bullish on, on new PRs and are very eager to, to help you out. So that is a very good process to, to go through, can recommend. Also for Tokyo, the process is a little bit longer because there, there's more sort of decisions to be made, more documentation to write and to sort of get that right. Uh, but still it's very rewarding when you can then later, like Tokyo released a new release a couple weeks ago and I was able to use some of the stuff I added, which is a really nice sort of full circle moment. Um, yeah, so we've been working on this for a little over a year now. It started out as a, a project sort of facilitated by the Internet Security Research Group, who also do a lot of other cool Rust work, and they run um, Let's Encrypt, um, which is also in part why they're interested in, in NTP. Um, so they funded the initial sort of development of NTP and then an extension called NTS, which adds more security. Um, and then recently we did a security audit, which found a couple of additional sort of weird combinations of, of um, uh, configuration that would panic and we patch those. And we now have an alpha release. And then in the future, we hope to sort of build this out uh, into an actual 1.0 release. We didn't quite feel confident yet to, to sort of commit to that right now, but it's very much on the roadmap. 
Um, and um, if you are the sort of person and you know, reveal preference, everyone here likes Rust, um, if you want to try this out, if you want to replace a bunch of C code with uh, a nice Rust binary, you can. Uh, we have made a couple of installers. Uh, this is made with a tool called Plutos, which is really nice um, uh, for um, generating these, these installers across multiple targets. Um, the installers are necessary because we do a little bit of like user group and permission stuff, which is kind of, you know, you would have to like uh, stack overflow that otherwise, and we, we take care of it. Um, and please let us know if you do try this out, how it went, uh, what you think about what it does, and, and, and the documentation and all of that. Um, it's Linux only right now, but we have open PRs for FreeBSD and macOS, so we'll hopefully merge that soon. Yeah, so that um, is the talk. NTP is a, a protocol for synchronizing time over the network. It is essential for security, uh, for consistency and security. Um, so crucial infrastructure. And uh, NTP DRS is, is looking for early adopters now. And I'm also happy to talk about this uh, and our other time and work later today. Very cool. Who's got questions over there? So you mentioned about running NTP uh, continuously to handle clock drift over time. Do you plan to have support for a one-shot mode similar to NTP date where that it, for systems where that might be easier? And in particular, do you have any plans for like an NTPD library crate that someone could integrate if they want to build small embedded systems that want to do a one-off NTP sync? Um, so for that latter part, um, crate should already be available because that is actually convenient for distribution, especially if you want to get it into like um, Fedora is something we're thinking about. And actually uploading your crates to crates.io makes that process easier on their side. Um, so you can, it's not really made for that right now, and we are not making any commitments about like the API surface for the time being, um, but that's certainly something that can be done, which we also maybe want to look into for more of our, our own tooling, um, to sort of like dog food that. Um, in terms of one-shot updates, I think you could hack that on, or like build that on top of, uh, on top of the library. Um, it's also something that we, we do do, like NTP will sort of make one big jump if it, if it um, uh, things that is necessary. Like generally, you sort of steer the clock very gently. You, you speed it up or slow it down a little bit. Um, if you follow like Rust discourse about mono, uh, monotonic time, this is sort of related where jumping the clock might, like that's not a, not a nice thing to do to a computer if you can help it. Um, should be fine, but sometimes it isn't. Uh, yeah, let's go <laughs> over there. Uh, earlier in, the, in your talk, you said uh, we can guarantee it doesn't panic, yet the security audit, uh, it did find ways in which it could. Um, yeah, how, how do you do that? And how do you uh, get this guarantee before the security audit does? Okay, I, I said a guarantee, I, I guarantee it doesn't sec faults. I see, I see a lot of sec faults in my, in my other work, um, but um, we can guarantee it doesn't sec fault in the sense that we use the Rust compiler. We have a little bit of unsafe code around steering the clock um, and around like s some settings on UDP sockets, so they uh, give timestamps to us. Uh, otherwise, it's all completely safe Rust, and so we're very confident that um, it will never sec fault. Sort of modulo Rust C compiler bugs, but you know what can you do? Um, in terms of no panics, that one is way trickier because it's like Rust doesn't necessarily make that easy. Like a, a panic can be sort of hidden somewhere in some, some indexing operation. Um, and even there are actually a couple of places where we do explicitly panic because we consider it sort of better to, if we are ever in a sort of an invalid configuration, we say we're just gonna panic right now instead of continue to steer the clock because we might be doing something completely sort of wrong uh, based on wrong assumptions and it would steer you in a very uh, sort of, sort of very uh, wrong direction, basically, and so we we explicitly panic. What you don't want is sort of random panics because people can potentially exploit that to just take down your NTP daemon. Um, that's just like 
good coding practices and uh, security audits is, is kind of the best we can do. I think like there is a way to completely eliminate panics um, by having the linker do some magic, um, but that doesn't work for us because sometimes we do actually want to panic. I saw the, I think there was one more. Yeah, can you pass it down? You mentioned briefly Plutos. What is Plutos? How do you spell Plutos? Uh, okay. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it's from the Greek. It's <laughs> um, I think it's with O-U, so it's P-L-O-U. Yeah, you spell it as uh, Plautos. P-L-O-U-T-O-S. And what does it? Does it? Uh, it takes... Uh, uh, um, Rust, uh, it, it takes Rust code and it builds like uh, uh, Docker images, uh, Debian, uh, and Red Hat uh, packages out of it uh, for for different builds. So it does like the last three versions of Debian, last three versions of Fedora, mm -hmm. uh, et cetera, et cetera. So Rocky Linux, et cetera, et cetera. It's all supported. Um, so you just write the code, and uh, Platos will take care of uh, doing all of the packaging for you. It also does like linting and then all of the like, <laughs> it just takes all of that hassle away from us. We just run CI, it spins up like a hundred actions and then a while later it, it just works. Yeah, I think the only other thing I should mention is it heavily relies on GitHub Actions. Oh, yeah. uh, so currently it's only supported if your project uh, is in, in GitHub. Uh, uh, you would, you know, there's, there's a lot of interest in this. Uh, it's managed by Nelnet Labs. Uh, and we would like to uh, uh, also make it available for other other platforms, such as GitLab. Oh yeah, we take PRs for that. All right, thanks a lot. Uh, then, then we are the only people standing between you and lunch. Um, <laughs> hang on. <laughs> <laughs>